Det är inte ofta man läser så otroligt många eh, entusiastiska recensioner som kring den här boken vi ska prata om nu. Det här är inte bara en stor bok till omfånget, skrev en recensent, utan även till innehållet. Den handlar om vänskap och vänskap som kanske börjar ta större och större plats i våra liv när singelhutsåldern ökar och familjer bryts upp. Då är det vänskap som är det hållbara. Men vänskap kan också råka ut för mycket och skildras på många olika sätt. Ja, när jag hade läst den här så ville jag inte läsa någon bok mer. Det här är en skakande skildring och det handlar också om när en person som man så gärna vill hjälpa inte vill ta emot hjälp, vad gör man då som vän? Ja, massor med frågor väcktes när jag läste den här och när folk har läst den här. Nu ska ni få höra vad författaren själv säger. Welcome to my show, uh, Hanya Yaganihara. Thank you so much for having me. And I've been reading this a little life and it's not like only reading, it's like being in your world because it's it's a demanding thing that you yes, it is, I think, isn't it? It's like eight hundred pages or yes, something. Yes. But I will start it's it's a fantastic um thing to be in a novel that never ends, sort mm -hmm. of. Uh, because you kind of get into a world mm -hmm. and then you are with these characters mm -hmm. all the time. But let's start with your uh, with the cover. Yes. What is this? Because I know it has it's important to you. It was very important to me. This is also the photograph on the American edition. It's by an artist named Peter Hujar, who um, was a contemporary of Robert Maplethorpe's in New York in the early 80s. He died of complications due to AIDS in 1987. And it's from a series of photographs called Orgasmic Man. And the thing I love about this photograph is you don't know whether he's in pleasure or in pain. But you have the sense as a, as, a, as a viewer that you are trespassing upon this unbearably intimate moment. Mm -hmm. And I think it echoed how I want the reader to feel while in the grips of this book as well. And of course, if you have a face like this, I think it's Jude, one of the characters, uh, and I think it's pain. But then I heard that you had mentioned it could also be uh, orgasm or something, yes. pleasure. But, but it depends how you really feel when you see it. Yes, I mean, I think the mystery of the image, and I, I hope the mystery of the book, is that you really don't, you feel a little bit unsettled looking at it. You, you wonder, are you keeping this person company or are you a voyeur? Are you seeing something you shouldn't see? Mm -hmm. But either way, I think you realize that you are a witness to an unbearably intimate moment. And that's how I want the reader to mm. feel while reading the book mm. as well. And I think you succeed because it's hard to not to kind of look at it for a long time. Thank you. The cover. It's about friendship. Mm. It's about um, three young men. Mm -hmm. And it's G J four young men, sorry. Uh, and they are all, um, they meet in college and yes. they come from different uh, upbringings. Yes. Uh, but they really have this strong friendship. Uh, and I know that you think friendship is something that will last more than traditional relationships mm. be between maybe man and a woman or... Uh, I guess it's not so much that I think it will last longer or that it's more important, but I do think it was a reckoning with the fact that for much of human civilization, marriage was not something that was associated with romance or affection. It was a practical kind of relationship. And so a friend, in no, no matter how oppressive a society we live in, was the one person we could choose. You couldn't choose your family. You couldn't choose your husband or wife often. You couldn't choose your religion or your caste or, or your job. But you could choose a friend. And therefore, it remains an essential human relationship, something that can never be legalized, something that can never be overseen and is defined only by the people within it. And in this age, I think in particular, it, there's something quite powerful in that and having a kind of relationship that can't be adjudicated and is deeply private. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the things I wanted to explore mm -hmm. in this book. Do you believe in friendship that will last longer? That would be something that you can really hold on to? Because this is what the book is about. The book is about that. And it's about how much work friendship is. You know, unlike... Um, say, a, a, a sexual relationship, there isn't perhaps that charge of chemistry or eroticism. But that doesn't mean that it's not something that also relies upon a certain mutual attraction and therefore can sustain itself for much longer 
as long as the people within it are willing to treat it with as much gravity um, and seriousness as they might a marriage or they might their relationship with the child or they might a relationship with an employer. I hope it makes the argument for the flexibility of friendship, but also an argument for the necessity of, of investing in it. Mm -hmm. You have said, I know, that you felt a lot of freedom when you were writing mm -hmm. because you go into very deep into these main characters in the book. And um, you had one reader, was that so? I had one a reader, friend. yes, my best friend. Which is interesting because that, in that sense you could have all this freedom that mm -hmm. probably writers, traditionally writers, don't have. I think every writer has to figure out for herself what creative process works best for her. And mm -hmm. some people really enjoy having lots of people read their work in progress. Some people don't want to show it to anybody at all. But I think we have gotten to a point where there's so many rules about how you should be a writer and how you should write. And it really is a very personal relationship mm -hmm. with the text and with, with your reader. I certainly didn't think while I was writing this book of an imaginary reader. I don't think you get anywhere trying to predict who that person might be. Um, so you really are writing it for yourself and writing it for the person you're intended, to use an old-fashioned romantic mm -hmm. term, someone you really hope you're speaking to on a deeply personal level. We, we in the book, you, can, you follow these four characters in the book. You get to know a lot about three of them. Mm. But there is one that is like a mystery and the, the other friends don't dare to mm. ask him questions about his background mm -hmm. because there is something around him that is very mm. tense. I wanted the book to feel, uh, to change form. So in the first section that you mentioned, it feels very much like a typical buildings roman of four college students moving to New York and after graduation and trying to make their way. And then it becomes something else. It becomes more of a character portrait. And then it becomes a mystery. My best friend called it an emotional thriller, and I think that's right. Mm -hmm. If you look at the structure and the pace of it, it does unfold very much as a traditional thriller might. And that is, in many ways, how we experience the lives of people we know. We think we know them, and then as we um, spend more and more time with them, we realize that we know them less and less and less. Did you borrow from uh, friends uh, the characters, or how did you find them? Not at all. I, they Nothing consciously, at least. You know, I think a writer always leaves a small deposit of herself in each one of the characters, but often in a way that's so subconscious that she's not able to, to tell or identify herself. Um, they very much came to me whole, and it's not a very satisfying answer, but um, they were people I dreamed up one day. and You and, dreamed of them? Well, not literally, but daydreamed of them, okay. I suppose. And then they kept living with me mm -hmm. until I actually mm -hmm. began to write them. How long time did you spend doing this process of writing? I wrote the book in 18 months, but I was probably thinking about it actively for five years before mm -hmm. that. Because you go very deep into details. Mm -hmm. You get to know so many things. I don't know. How did you find out about all these facts? Because it's about <laughs> everything. Well, like most writers and most Americans, I know nothing about science or math. So I had to really educate myself on those two fields in particular. I did most of my research about their respective careers. You know, the book is set in New York. Careers are very important there, perhaps too important. Um, but I didn't do any research into their various psychologies and how they might react to the events and the traumas of their past. That seemed very natural to me. But I did want to make sure I had the facts of their lives correct. Mm -hmm. If you look at these four uh, characters, these four people, they... Each of them have their own has their own um, shield, so to, mm. so to say, and strategy to cope with life. Yes, very because much. they do di different things, but they keep together with, uh, within their friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if we take one of them, William, mm. he's a nice guy, mm -hmm. and he has a big heart because mm -hmm. he had um, a, a little brother that mm. was really who died early, mm -hmm. and and he he's a very emotional. Mm -hmm with a lot of empathy, but mm. that's not easy in no. his life either. No, it's not. But I do, one of the things I hope this book argues for is that there is no such thing as inherent good or inherent evil. 
But I do think some people like Willem have a natural talent for being good people, for being decent people, for being kind people. They have the gift of compassion. And other people have to learn that, mm -hmm. like JB, the, another character in the mm -hmm. book who's a painter, um, for whom being good does not come naturally. But all of the but characters... But he, he is affected by William. He is, he is. Mm -hmm. And all of the characters in the book have to make decisions about how they're going to behave. And they don't always choose correctly. But they do learn, I think, all of them, that it is a matter of choice and not a matter of nature. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should spoil anything no, because we have to leave a lot to the reader. But Jude is a main character in yes. the book. Maybe, and I think this is interesting because people that don't speak much about how they feel, their background, they kind of have a secret mm. uh, attitude. They get most attention, Yes, which is very strange. Yes, they always do in life as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I think part of modern friendship is to try to figure out in the modern age is to try to figure out the mystery of the self and the psyche. And we are always drawn to people who are mysterious to us in some ways. There is the sense that among between friends, trading secrets is a form of currency. It's a way of expressing trust and expressing love. And, um, and I do believe in that to some extent. But I think another thing Jude's friends learn is that they can leave him with his, his, his secrets, mm -hmm. that sometimes... It a secret, hard. it's very hard. And sometimes a secret is all a person has. Mm -hmm. And the difficult thing is for them to decide whether it's a secret that is is worth holding on to or something that in its sharing might alleviate some personal pain. Mm -hmm. What happened with you when you, uh, when you left, when you ended the story mm -hmm. with these people that you've been so close to? Uh, was it that um, it was a sad thing to do or...? Well, I missed them. You know, mm -hmm. I lived with them very intensely for mm -hmm. 18 months and dreamed about them literally and thought about them at all times. And so I did feel bereft um, to a certain extent when the book was over. What I hadn't anticipated is that characters you create stay with you for much longer than you might imagine. You think that the book is done and therefore I'm walking away and it's not quite that neat. Mm -hmm. You know, you've created something, a monster, in a, as it were, even a monster you love, and it's it's you can't just kill them off by ending their story. They they do remain very much alive to you, and that's been the you've case been, for me. You got questions. I know you uh, you have got questions about why you uh, do everything. You blow up things mm. and you go deeply into pain and and you exaggerate a lot of things. What's, why do you do that? What did you want to? Well, the book, is a the book is a fantasy and it is fantastical in many of its elements, as you mentioned. But I also wanted to write an old fashioned book. You know, the trend in fiction these days is to write books that are a little bit remote, that are a little bit distant, that are a little bit ironic. This is not any of those things. It's a very sincere book. And I do feel that it's immersive because of its sincerity, that it, allow it forces the reader to contend with certain sorts of emotions and exaggerations of scale in a way that they might not have in, in another novel. Um, but I also think that it lends a sort of intimacy to the experience. It makes the reader feel personally invested. It makes the reader feel implicated in these characters' lives. It's a lot of different uh, way of reaction you get from, from the readers, readers mm. I presume, because mm. uh, some people read it as a, a gay story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other people read it as a, a, a story about friendship, mm -hmm. what it's worth. Mm -hmm. uh, is that nice that they kind of interpret it in a different way? Yes. I mean, once your book is published, it's not your book anymore to a certain degree. It's the readers. And I've been startled and, and honored and surprised by the many different ways readers have interpreted this book. It's often not what you, the author, intend at all, but the honor of it is that someone has seen something of their own lives in it. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been asked, why isn't 9-11 in the book? Mm. Because this is happening during the, the time of the, the story. Yes, there's no history in the book. As you mentioned, there's no 9-11, there's no presidential elections, there's no AIDS, there's no financial crisis. And when you remove history cultural context from a novel, what you really do is trap the reader in the emotional universes of the characters. Mm -hmm. They have nowhere else to go. 
They can never explain away a character's bad behavior by saying, well, this was happening in New York at this time. That's why they're behaving poorly. It is you have only the information that the author gives you. And the information in this case is how these characters are responding to the facts of their past. And again, I think it, it makes the book feel quite intense and quite personal um, and also out of time. It gives it a sort of fairy tale dreaminess, I hope, um, that 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 makes it feel that it could be any time or no time at all. And my life and your life. Yes, exactly. Because you feel you get everything in it. Yes, I think I hope you so. can find everything. I hope so. Thank you so much. And Thank I really hope much. that a lot of people will Read and be thank a little you. bit patient because it takes a lot of time, <laughs> but it's worth it. Well, thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you for thank you very much for having me. And 